All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is our, our third uh, talk in our series called Sikhi in the Professional World. The kind of aim of this was to kind of destabilize the idea of what a professional means, to look at people from a wide variety of backgrounds and look at the way Sikhi has influenced what they do. Uh, before we get into it, I just want to ask a few housekeeping rules. Uh, first things first, uh, just want to ask you if you guys could please kindly mute yourselves just so we don't get any feedback. And another thing, we will be recording today. So if you're uncomfortable having your face on a camera, you, you, have, our, you have our permission to turn it off. Um, and yeah, I think that's all the housekeeping out of the way. Uh, the what this session will be done today, we'll kind of, uh, kind of hand the floor over to Baji and we, will be we can take questions as you go. So if, if anything comes into mind um, throughout today, just please feel free to pop your questions in the chat or put your hands up at any point. Uh, and that and so that brings us to uh, today. Uh, we want to like, kindly invite Jigit Baji, and he's one of the founders and organizers of an organization called Zero Hunger with Langer. And they're an international organization that works to fight food hunger, uh, primarily in East Africa. And they embody the idea of Langer and to empower these communities by setting up community kitchens. So Jigit Baji, a warm welcome to you, and thank you for coming to uh, to coming to join us today. And, Otherwise, we will give you the floor. Thank you very much, Arjun. Waigudi ka khalsa, waigudi ki fateh to everybody. Um, I'm really uh, grateful for the opportunity um, to be able to share what we do, uh, especially with. Uh, sorry about my dog. He's uh, <laughs> he um, he um, to be such a such a prestigious institution, especially at University of Cambridge. Um, appreciate that some of you guys, and you've been told about some of them are, you're hopefully you're gonna be some of the most productive and, and, and um, constructive members of society going forward, um, given the education you guys are getting. Um, and I think I wanna applaud each and every single one of you to be, a, uh, first of all, in getting into such a, such a place and then being able to, uh, still organizing events like this, that you can see how your professional lives might be impacted um, or influenced by what people are doing in the world right now. Um, for us, first and foremost, it's about Sikhi and the Sikh ethos of what Guru Maharaj have bestowed upon us and then go out and tell us to practice in the world. Um, Gurbani is, the theory of Sikhi is um, flawless. Um, the practice is something else. Um, and in the world that we live in now, it's difficult. It's very, very difficult. You, you will come, or we certainly come across uh, situations where, you know, we have to question ourselves. We have to question the reality. Sometimes we have to walk away things. And sometimes it's difficult to be able to make decisions um, because you think this is at odd end, uh, at, you know, at different ends of what we're trying to achieve. And in that, and in those cases, a good sangat, um, and especially as we are blessed with Mahapur Khadi Sangat with Paisa Pai Mahindra Singh Ji, Chairman of Guru Nanak Nishkam Sevak Jatha, and the Nishkam group of charitable organizations worldwide, where we're able to draw upon their vast experience and um, wisdom to be able to go forth and handle some of the stuff that we're handling in the world. Um, after having said that, what I would like to do is just show a short video of Paisabji basically narrating what it means um, to do Nishkam Seva. Um, what are the values that are being practiced um, and how we might be able to do that in the world. And then straight after that, I want to be, I want to show you an episode of one of our videos, a video series called The Journey to Food and Freedom. Dig, dig, for their freedom, victory beat to food and freedom um, of how we think we're applying those values, um, theoretical values in a practical way around the world. So without further ado, I'm just going to um, play the video. And uh, if there's any issues with audio, uh, please do shout straight away. Yeah.
we believe that the whole of humanity is actually one large family. There are many denominations within religions and so on. But we believe that one should have respect for everybody across religion, across creeds and social status, whatever. That is the message that Guru Nanak gave. We are here for a purpose. The three cardinal questions that are asked are Where are you from? What are you supposed to do here? And where will you ultimately end up? So within that context, we are spiritual travelers. So our destination and our roots are in fact the same. And we report to one singular all-powerful Almighty. We're all God's children. And I think that is what we try and practice. and successive gurus are very explicit. They say if you are born in a particular religion, be good, excel in that particular religion. should serve unconditionally. God loves us unconditionally. When you are serving, you should take yourself out of the equation. In other words, you should not serve with arrogance, with an ego. You should feel honored and privileged that you are able to serve God's creation. That is what is required. This game of love is not for the faint-hearted. Love is not a joke. It is a very powerful, powerful emotion. And it requires you to totally and absolutely submit yourself is total and absolute sacrifice. That is what Seva is, Nishkam Seva. And not looking for anything as a reward. You do it for the love of it. I often ask people, give me another word for love and they struggle. And I console them and I say, there is no other word for love, I will tell you. The nearest word is sacrifice. If you cannot sacrifice, you cannot love. If you cannot sacrifice, you cannot serve. Nishkam means total, total sacrifice. In the morning prayer of a Sikh, we read, Saach kaho, sun leo sabay, jin prem kiyo tin hi prab payo. If you want to get to God, you want to fuse in God, because that is what salvation is. You become part of Him. Then you will have to love Him, utterly and absolutely. But to love him, you'll have to love 
his entire creation. He did not create anything that is superfluous. From pure matter to pure spirit, through vegetation, animals, humans and better humans, until you have pure spirit, God himself, all these different categories through which you may pass, you have to love them. Compassion is the first rung of the ladder of spirituality. Compassion is very important. No compassion, no religion, no faith. So, love, compassion, forgiveness, these are the toolkits of his spiritual path. Don't define what you want. Just do it for the love of him. That is selflessness. I always find that video quite moving, um, especially when Baba you're talking about compassion, sacrifice and love, and breaking it down into its individual components and what it takes to be able to get to certain levels. Um, I think that really lays the foundation of what we are trying to do at Zero Hunger with Lunger in the world um, and how we've actively gone out and practiced or tried to um, establish on a practical sense um, and apply that uh, in our daily activities. Um, for those of that uh, do know or have been following the journey, um, our journey started in 2016 um, when I was watching a, a, a speech by somebody we're giving at the United Nations. Um, and it was while they were giving that speech that I had, uh, I guess, the inspiration came to me for Zero Hunger with Lunger. Um, they were there standing at the, at the podium where world leaders stand, uh, presidents, kings, queens, statesmen. And I was absolutely blown away by the fact that Guru Maharaj is sick uh, by Sabji in this instance, were there uh, delivering a speech. And one of the first things they said, well, in fact, the first thing they said when they got to the stage was they greeted everybody with Why would you go Khalsa, Why would you put there? And I think that was a real moment in my life where I knew that, well, by Sabji are there really. Um, helping set the world agenda or influence the world agenda um, from a sick perspective. Because, you know, if we look at the United Nations through a lens of just pure objectivity, um, there are a bunch of countries that have got together um, and want to make the world a better place. Now, the politics of it, we can argue till the cows come home, right? But if you look at the essence of what they're trying to achieve um, or why it might have been set up in the first place, um, it's basically trying to eradicate things like hunger, poverty, um, economic inequality. So as values, as, as, as sort of base values, they sort of very much align with what Maharaj are trying to tell us to go out and practice into the world, right? Um, and it was while I was watching their speech that I started thinking, wow, okay, um, I wonder what else the United Nations get up to. Um, and I was watching, while I was watching them through on, on Google, I opened another tab in Chrome and literally put it to Google, what do the United Nations do, right? Um, and those of you that know, in 2015, they released 17 Sustainable Development Goals, um, which are out based basically about ending world hunger, um, eradicating poverty, equal um, opportunities for women, um, all sorts of things that we would think that, wow, okay, if, if I was a sick, that's the kind of thing I should be out there uh, trying to apply in my daily life, or at least what well, part of my work would really be part of my seva. 
And goal number goal number one was ending poverty. Goal number two was actually is actually called zero hunger. And I don't know why, but I guess it's just inspiration from our age. I just opened up another tab in Google at the same time and searched where you know where is there hunger in the world? You know where is the where is the most hunger in the world uh, right now? Um, and Malawi came up as one of the uh, most malnourished uh, uh, places on earth. And I knew Malawi was in Africa. I didn't know it was in East Africa. If most, if you ask most people to try and uh, pinpoint where Malawi is on a, on a globe, most people wouldn't, wouldn't know. Um, but it's South East Africa, just north of Zambia and South Africa, uh, sandwiched between Mozambique, Zambia, and Tanzania to the north. Um, so a sliver of a country. Um, but it's one of the most poorest nations on earth. And I thought to myself, well, okay, I have heard about a lot of Sikhs in East Africa, and I wonder if there's uh, any Sikhs in Malawi. I opened another tab. Google's going to um, feature quite a lot in this, by the way. Um, uh, Google, I opened up another tab in Google and searched, are there any Sikhs in Africa? And uh, I was shocked by what came back. Um, there was actually, there's actually been a Godwara there since 1928. Um, you know, um, and I thought, and I thought to myself, wow, 1928. Okay, so that's longer than some Godore have been here in the UK. In fact, I don't think there was a Godore here in 1928. Some of you guys might know, uh, might know that, but I don't think it was until the 50s or Shepherd's Bush Godore um, Saab came along or, or the 40s. I'm not sure, but 1928. Yeah. So I thought, well, okay, the concept. If I was to go to Malawi today, and this is while I'm sitting there watching the speech, I could say the word Lunga to somebody who looked distinctly like me, um, whether he kept his case or not, and they would know what it is. So why is it that in, a, in that country, we have the biggest hunger, but we have Lunga there also? And that's where it clicked. And I thought to myself, well, hold on, where would, where's Guru, Jithe Guru Mahal the Langar Hove? Where there's Lunga, there's just no space for hunger. And that's where the concept of zero hunger with number. All I did was literally take zero hunger United Nations target and married and put a with in the middle and put longer on the end. Yeah. So what that's what we want to do. It's pretty simple stuff. Um, the, by subject in New York giving that speech, and that was a Wednesday, I think it was. Uh, by Friday, they were flying back. Saturday morning, seven o'clock in the morning, I'm outside their office. If anyone's been to Sorod Godara, their office is upstairs, number seven. Um, and I was waiting there and they came in and, um, and, 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 and you know, the, everyone did their darshan. And I had this really, you know, like a kid, like a really uh, glowing look on my face. And I said, Bobby, I said, Handi so I go, Bobby, I think we've got the solution to end world hunger. <laughs> and they said, what is it saying? And I said, Bobby, it's hunger. <laughs> and they, they looked at me like I was some sort of kid, you know, um, but that's how excited I was about it. And I was like, well, hold on, Bobby, look, you know, because we've got Lunga as Sikhs, we have Lunga. There just shouldn't be any lung hunger in the world. And literally, that's how the naivety I took to this, um, I guess, this idea. Um, after all the Sangat had left, they asked me to sit down and talk to them. And I, and when I did talk to them, I was, I was, I was actually quite taken aback by what they told me. By subject, they themselves were born in Uganda. Yeah, um, their mother passed away when they were young. And then they moved to India to complete their education. And then they got, when they came back to Africa, they got married and they settled in Zambia, right? Um, Zambia is uh, just west of um, Malawi. And there's a, there's a half decent road connecting the two countries. Um, and what Baisabji used to do on the, because they were, they were a civil engineer with the British, uh, with a British company out there. And what they used to do on their, on their, on their days off and the weekends off, um, they actually used to travel to Malawi with, with Mataji um, and to, to a place called Lake Malawi, which is a really, really lovely place. Um, but before going there, they would visit Malawi Godra. Here's me just two days before discovered, thinking I've just discovered this Godra from 1928 that, you know, like, you know, like an Indiana Jones film, I'm going to go there, it's going to be overgrown and, you know, I'm going to be able to discover it. Um, and they told me that they used to go there themselves. Um, which really I was, you know, to me, everything is divinely purposed and uh, I just couldn't believe, I couldn't believe it. And then the next thing they told me was the Guru, 
the Guru Maharaj Sarup that they have in their home in the UK right now um, is actually from Malawi Godrasa. Yeah. Um, and the next words they said to me was, okay, Jagdeet Singh, it's time for you, to, it's time for you to go back now. Um, and I said, back where? They go back to Malawi. And I was like, okay, but I've never been to Malawi. And I said, well, uh, by subject, I don't think I can do this project because I think someone in the Jata who's got the time and is educated and, and can really take this forward as far as the United Nations and stuff like that is concerned. This is this is a project that's caliber of it's, it's far it's way over my head. And they started laughing really loudly. So they said, no, 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 you're the person who's going to do this. Um, and I said, well, by subject, when should I? When should I go? And they said, well, what are you still doing sitting here? Um, four days later, I was on my first ever trip to Malawi, um, to the African subcontinent. I'd never been to Africa before. It took me 24 hours to get there. Um, and since then, I've caught a year, every year, I catch about 45 flights. Um, so I'm, I'm at 30,000, 40,000 feet most of the time. Uh, so my life, my life has changed a lot in the last few years. Um, with COVID last year, I was in the I was in country in February when the COVID uh, pandemic broke out and I couldn't travel back to the UK. So I was there for about eight months. Um, and I'm telling you, I, I, I think they had more control of it than, than we have over here. Um, but it's been a whirlwind of a journey up to now. And I just want to show you, I mean, this is a good time to show a quick episode of the journey to food and freedom. It just give you a bit of practical application of what we're trying to do. And I think after that, I'm happy to take some, um, some questions. Um, yeah, so without further ado, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put that on. Again, let me know if you're not, can't see the screen, please, yes? Uh, Arjun, can you see my screen, by the way? Uh, not yet, buddy. Okay, sorry. I'll just try and share again. There we go. Yep. Okay. I compel any one of you to walk past a starving child on earth. I compel, I asked you to. Just walk past it. You won't be able to do it. Compassion is your most natural state. This world has already got everything it needs right here, right now. There's nothing that we can't achieve. It's not a job. It's not a profession. This is a way of life. It's a conscious decision to say, we're going to do more of us very well we're going to amplify that and the results are in front of you yeah, yeah. nice to meet you how are you Muli Banji, huh? right this, this is as much as you it's well yeah. okay all right so they're hard at work huh yeah. good well it's good to see men at work yeah yeah i think so this is more like it, yeah? The last time we came here, there was none of this here, none of that there, yet there's 1,300 kids who need serving on a daily basis. But without this kind of, the kids can't just eat out in the open air. The rainy season comes, but this is all, look at this, it's all, this turns into mud. And so the kids can't sit in the mud. Now that we're building this facility, 200, 400 kids at a time will be served in a sitting. So we're going to have three sittings on a daily, every single day, three sittings. Four, eight, twelve, we'll squeeze a few more in there, but three sittings every single day. So they can sit in an area which is covered, they're not going to be um, exposed to the elements. And we've got a kitchen here, this kitchen's massive. What they're going <laughs> to, the good thing is, there's going to be four burners in each corner. This is one of the first ever Zero Hunger with Lunga kitchens been built. Four burners in each corner and a massive distribution in the middle. So um, this is where real, real change is happening, where we can come in. There's a big requirement on a daily basis, but we're also happening, help, helping with the infrastructure, an environment which is safe and solid for the kids. Um, not only are we stopping them from working in fields, but when we're serving, we're making sure it's not just done anywhere, it's done in a safe place. You know, this is a monumental time, some real milestone of where we are on the Mozambique border. Um, yeah, it's good to be back. 
and seeing this level of development. I can't wait to come back here and see the kids. I can't wait to come back and see the sittings happening. You know, it reminds me of when we had the restaurant. We used to have sittings on a Friday night, five to seven, seven to nine, and nine till 11. It almost feels like that, and I feel excited about being here again and thinking, oh, I want to be back here and doing that kind of thing again and again and again and again, yes? Getting, making sure people come in. The five o'clock to seven o'clock bookings are in. Get them seated. Let's get them, let's get them served. Let's ask them for what drinks they want. Oh, now let's prepare for the seven till nine. And then when it came to 12, midnight, one o'clock in the morning, you just thought, yeah, man, we've had a good day. When the headmaster was talking about sittings and, and people coming in and then getting people in and out, it almost, there's, there's, that, there's that thing about younger and coming in and I really want to see it working. People coming in one way, being served, you know, another set coming in, waiting, being served. I want it to see it work like clockwork. I think that's the next thing here and we'll be back to, uh, uh, to capture that and then share it with everyone else. We ask the community to be involved in what we're doing rather than saying don't Really, please do not take a handout from us. We put that, we extend those handouts to them and say, please do not just take a handout from us. Help us give a hand up. And this is the local community. These bricks, these bricks have been made here, yeah, locally, been donated by the local community to us free of charge. So we can start serving here. So it's a real community project. It's real, they're part of it. We're in the heart of the community and it's the hand, it's a hand up uh, part. They feel part, they have ownership, they see that what the fruits of their labour, they're going to help build this, then we're going to come and help serve, then the kids are going to get educated. It's that tri-party, it's that community, it's that togetherness which is going to fix this problem. Um, I'm really excited, I'm really, really excited. I'm just going to check out that story. FIFO, FIFO. Okay, yeah. that is a system. So first, which has come this month, yeah. till that is consumed, don't that the new stock should be stocked at the at the back. Mm. Okay. So clear color range. First, you can write there. This is the first. So yes. This is the stock first. So this is the second one. Okay. Now, second should be used for after that. The food is blessed before it comes. Okay. Because food is given to us by God, huh? oh, yes. by Mother Earth. So we should respect it when you're giving it to God's children as well. Yeah. yeah? So we store it very carefully. I'll do. Everyone jump. Jump. Hey. <laughs> Um, so hopefully that gave you a bit of a, uh, an insight of how we're practically going out there and trying to practice what we do. The philosophy of Sikhi, Nithos and Maharaj are at the forefront of any decision we try to make, um, whether it's as simple as where we source our food from, where we, how we set up our distribution network, um, the partners we work with, um, even down to the plates that we serve from, yeah, um, are recyclable. We try to think of it all. We don't get it right all the time, um, but we're trying our utmost best. Um, if anyone's interested in watching the series, uh, you can go to our website, zerohungerwithlunger.org. Um, check it out on there. Um, I'd advise, you know, it'd be great to get your comments on it, in fact. Um, and hopefully you'd be inspired and if you've got any questions, um, please shout. Please shout. Uh, Baji, I've got a question, actually. Yeah. And that's kind of like a lot of kind of common criticism normally of a lot of kind of organizations that just kind of work is that they don't normally come and serve those communities that they, that they, that they aim to. And I think my question is, I guess, what makes Zero Hunger Longer different? And kind of what are you doing to kind of empower these communities and not just kind of provide things? Yeah, one of the things you would have heard in that video was giving a hand up and not just a hand out. The, the, the NGO industry, if you like, across, uh, you know, particularly Africa, the only thing I can talk about Africa with any sort of um, authority, it's become a $60 billion industry across the, across the continent. Um, and we didn't want to be part of that issue. So when we first went in, first six months was just recon of what is happening in the country. Why is there poverty? Trying to figure out if there's other people in the country doing a good job, 
it's not a, it's not worth us going up and setting up another stall and just dividing you know what I mean? why don't we just try and help the people the people who are doing a good job on the ground and in fact for the first six months to eight months we did that um it got to the point we were growing so quickly that we established an office there and the only way we were going to do that was by engaging the local seat the aspera um we didn't you know it's ten thousand miles from where i live you know here in birmingham um and no matter with whatever will uh, i wouldn't be able to spend all my life there um so what we do is we made a conscious effort first of all to say look serving on a daily basis of buying in food is just a short to medium term solution for us what we did in november of 2016 is invested some money into 10 hectares of land in lilongwe which is um, the capital city of Malawi. It's about four or five hours from where, where the video was taken. Um, and what we did is we worked with another company called Love Support Unite, uh, a company rather, another organization. And what we said is what we want to do is empower the farmers, we'll pay for the inputs, we'll help them with seed quality, we'll help them with irrigation. Um, and what we'll do is we'll use the farm outputs, the grain, in the longer serving program local in that community and what we will do with any excess is sell it on the open market um, and give the and give the money back to the farmers so what we did is we planted in november we they harvested in the following march or april um, and we did exactly that and what we found was that people do not want just a handout they don't want to just be seen as um poor or helpless you know um there is an element of that there's this fatigue set in as well um this what happens is after a while look if i keep coming and giving you food on a daily basis after a while you're going to stop getting up yourself and start making it you know you have to it's a it's a difficult habit to work people out of and there were certainly some people who took the mick if you like for use of a better phrase um and um, but what we found is the majority of people wanted to do that they wanted to be empowered it wasn't perfect but it was definitely set us in the in the in the right in the right way so farming is something we've invested in heavily since then um and for those who are following the journey you'll know that we have 300 acres of our own land now in kenya where we produce uh 10 million meals on a yearly basis um and that's from our own crops of maize and wheat so farming empowering using the land local people's land for their own good um, setting up, making sure we're setting up our longer programs alongside schools, if not with the schools, so that encourages kids to attend the schools, get the education, and then, you know, work themselves out of poverty. That's the, that's the, if you like, that's the oasis. That's the, that's the big, that's the big vision. We're working with other organisations. We're not education experts, but we are working with education um, NGOs in country. Awesome. Uh, we've got a question in the chat here from Ahmed, asking, um, what's the best way for the average person to get involved and to help? For with zero hunger with hunger or just generally doing seva? Uh, both. Good question. Um, Pre-COVID, one of the things that I've been trying to set up in Africa is a center of excellence in Kenya. Um, and what that, the, the, the vision of that is to have people of your age, um, and if not younger, to be honest, to come out stay with us, be an active part of the seva, i.e. follow the journey of the food from farm to fork, okay? Um, and spend time at these schools if uh, uh, out there. So what we don't want to do is, with all due respect, we don't want to just do this ecom where we say, look, let's get a few of you together on a plane and let's go out there. The world's changed a lot now, yeah? Um, we sort of want to do it with anything with nishkan based projects, we're tied down to you know doing things properly um so our, our aim is is to set up volunteering see i'm, I'm careful what i'm saying here because you know as you guys will be aware there's a lot of what do they call it volunteering tourism there's a word for it um modern tourism yeah modern tourism right? uh, we're, we want to be careful because we don't want to set up jollies for kids to go out and then just spatter the instagrams or whatever we don't mind you know, we want to do that look that's that's your thing but we want you to get a true essence of what it means and when you have a real perspective coming back to the country that we live in for all the faults that the uk might have and i'm not talking about political or anything i'm talking about just living quality guys 
it's going to make you thank your grandparents or your parents for even coming here in the first place. All right. Um, that level of appreciation and perspective that you get when you're here is on another level. So if you know, I've got so many things wrong in my house and my mom and my wife are constantly nagging me like the door handles broken or the taps leaking. But I said, my old my, my retort is at least we have a door and at least we have a, a tap that's leaking because I can take you, we, I, I literally live in places where none of that is available. So we really, I, my personal um, object, one of my personal objective is to take people on a journey, you know? Um, so you can tell that story. You, I want to amplify it. And every single person on this call um, can help out and fly. I see them as, as vehicles to amplify the message, not just for zero hunger, but generally going out and getting perspective, working people out of like, the amount of mental health issues that we're seeing, even during COVID period right now, is that we're, we're, you know, we're, we're feeling, oh my God, I can't do anything, I'm powerless and all this kind of stuff. Um, when you're out there practicing and seeing that there's, a, there's people, if there's, if there's people in the line in front of you, there's a there's a few billion behind you as well yeah and that gives you appreciation of where you are right now it doesn't stop you progressing but it gives you a real appreciation of where you are right now so that's in a long-winded way that's what we're trying to achieve um so once we get that program set up it's gonna have to be after covid and when everything's safe and and and, and you know people are allowed to travel and whatever restrictions are going to be put in place we're hoping to set that up and and you know of course Partnering with people like University of Cambridge, Seeksock, they're the kind of first places we'd come and talk to and say, right, guys, this is what we're planning on doing. It ain't going to be perfect straight away, but you're going to have to, uh, you're going to help us, help us um, create this program, you know, even help define it um, and make the journey for other people. Because the pioneers, well, the people who do this thing first are all the ones that see all the, uh, you're the ones that have to build the bridges for the other people. Make it easy. That's always the way I see it. The seva is not for us as much as it is for the future generations. And we're almost just going there, creating those bridges, creating the ways where people can come and sort of uh, follow in those footsteps and make their life a bit more easier for them. So hopefully I think by, look, I can't give you a date, but I reckon within the next year and a half, two years, given the state of the world right now, we'll, we'll have something set up. Awesome. Um, yeah, and speaking of the state of the world, uh, had you also got a question? Uh, and he's asking um, about the seva doing, uh, currently now in the conditions in Malawi. And he's asking, is this seva being done currently under COVID conditions in Malawi? And maybe maybe you could talk a bit more just about how the pandemic has also affected communities in Malawi as well. Yeah, of course. One of the first things that happened, um, what the African nations did, which was good, um, was they closed all their borders last year and closed their schools straight away. All seva, everything was stopped. Literally, it was nothing was happening, um, which which is a real problem for us because one of the issues in Malawi specifically is a lack of medical um, care and facility. The people can be in villages with a broken leg for years and they wouldn't even know they've broken a leg, and they, they have no way of getting to the city to get to a hospital. The hospital that exists in southern Malawi, at least in Blantyre, is really understaffed. Um, no provisions, lack of machinery, the whole lot. And in fact, if you are anyone, if you've got a, if you're a person of means, most people who get any sort of illness or uh, med need medical attention fly to South Africa or Kenya, even the UK. So what we didn't want to do is become part of the problem um, because at that time, the whole pandemic was, or corona cases were uh, isolated to the city. Um, and if you travel out to the villages, even five kilometers outside of Blantyre, 10 kilometers outside of Blantyre, I mean, when, when I say it's rural, it's seriously rural, um, you would be, you'd, you'd be like setting off a, a forest fire. Um, so we had to stop. We were stopped for about six to seven months. What we did after that is we started supplying, doing food drops or um, grain drops to sort of village outside village um, outskirts of a village yeah where then um, the village males would come collect the sacks of food and take it in and we, we've been doing that for a while now um, schools in Malawi are still closed and until they're properly open we will not be under normal uh, business as usual um, we have over 350 daily 
volunteers in that country. Um, and a lot of them are local um, ladies from the villages in which we serve, mothers and uh, you know aunties or grandmothers of the children we serve, in fact. Um, and one of the last things we want to do is um, spread COVID or be part of that. Um, but, you know, they still do their seva when the food gets to them. It's, it's far from ideal right now. Um, one of the issues we have is distribution, purely because the lack of infrastructure. You know, we, 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 we can't, we're sending our pickups in or, or trucks in can only go to a certain point. Um, and we're battling with, with political and, and superstition out there as well. Uh, unfortunately, in countries like this, superstition is rife. And if a per person with a turban is seen going into a village or is approached, or we've gone into a village and suddenly there's an outbreak of COVID, you'll get blamed for it. And then that will spread very quickly. And then it's just all sort of mess. It, you've got to be very careful. So we're, 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 we've got a sort of an approach right now, which is working. We engage the local community as much as possible, um, but it's far from ideal. Well, definitely. Uh, and definitely. One kind of thing I was thinking, I was thinking of that as well is sort of, you said, you said kind of, so there's been a Sikh presence in Malawi since the uh, late twenties and, and there's obviously was, there was a massive diaspora group and still is in Kenya. You know, we, we always hear those stories about Mekindu Gudara and kind of settlements out there. And I guess, so what, what, what is the reception of, of Sikhs in Malawi? Was there so much of an integration between a local community and the diaspora community? And, and how's that been changing? Um, the answer is no, there wasn't any engagement, um, very minimal. Um, when I first flew into the country, they looked at me like I'd landed off a spaceship, yeah? Um, which, I, which I found was odd because in Blantyre, just literally half an hour, 45 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes from the airport, the Godot was there. And the, the, the street's called Temple Street, yeah? Oh. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, we're, we're still naming streets after Godot in this country till this day, right? And we think it's a big thing. That's been there since 1928, right? Yeah. So, so I, I think it's, it's no one's fault, right? Um, but, you know, being part of a community or living in a country which has done you so well, you know, the amount of wealth in Africa, I always talk about the amount of wealth in Africa will shock you, yeah? Um, and some of the wealth held by Sikhs will shock you also, yeah? Um, which always makes me laugh out there. But, and, and, and to me, it's like, it's such a perfect situation that Marla just set up for you. You should be sharing the fruits of what you have. And I think that's where it, it stems from, is the, is the local community see it as these guys are come from outside. In fact, they call me Muzungu. Muzungu means white man, which mm. I said to them, you know, that's a compliment from where I come from. Yeah, and they, <laughs> you know, it's a, you know, Mzungu, I mean, and for them, they see you as an outsider. And that's because we haven't actively outreached into the communities, right? Um, we, and, I, and I think we've helped, we've definitely helped with that. We've, we've, we've gone to places with people who lived in the country for 30, 40 years. And they said, Baji, we've never been here. This is literally 10 kilometers from where they live. And they'd never been there. So a lot of, we're breaking ground with a lot of these people. And I think seeing more and more Sikhs, they see the star, the kids are always pulling up my beard or my city saw my karpan. You know, it's, um, we're getting to share this now and they're seeing us as not as, shall I use the word invaders or people who just come here and take stuff and use us as slave labor. Um, in fact, these guys are out there trying to help us. And remember, we don't ask for anything in return. We encourage, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of Muslims in that country. In fact, it's predominantly Christian. In fact, yeah, it's the Scottish Pentecostal Church is massive over there because Scotland um, uh, was a uh, it was a colony of Scotland. Blantyre, the city of Blantyre, is actually named after a place in Scotland, um, and um, they, uh, they 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 you know rather than seeing us as people who are just coming in to take stuff, I wanted to say look, we're, we're sort of reversing that. One of our one of our aims is to get all 350 sevadars of our uh, of Zero Hunger Longer, which is Malawians, yeah, into the Godra. They don't even know where it is. You know, they've never been to the city. So hopefully, when all of this stuff is lifted, we want to we want to basically give them 
presentation. We want to actually serve langar to them, how it's served in the Godra. You know, the Godra is a beautiful place. It's not big, but it's it's enough to house that many people and to really show people, look, we're part of the community. You don't have to see us as a you and a me. We, we, let's talk in a we and more. And I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so yeah, there was a bit of there was a bit of um, resistance when we first went. You know, people were willing to help, but they weren't willing to go out into the villages. That's mm. just from the fact that you know, look, in a country which the average wage is I think less than one dollar twenty five. I think last stage one dollar twenty five cents a day, and Mr. Singh is driving around in a you know a Toyota a Land Cruiser. You, know, you can see the them and us attitude coming, right? So. Mm. We're, we're working, that's what we're working with. Amarjeet Singh, who you saw in the video there, is a gem of a man. Um, he's the country director of Zero Hunger with Langer. And without him, we would not even be where we are right now. That guy there, he's also now the chairman of the Sikh Malawi Association. Um, he's recovered from COVID recently, thank God for that. Um, he really helped us motor uh, the relations. In fact, we've got relations with the president now. We've got relations with the, uh, you know, with the um, uh, the ambassadors. ambassadors. So you know, we were really trying to say, look, this is not about us. This is about Malawi, and how can we help in building a better future for the country? You know. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I guess kind of a lot of those attitudes are kind of uh, it comes with a lot. Of, I guess unpackaging a lot of kind of the history of colonialism and, and and a lot of the history of Malawi itself, even when it comes to various places in East Africa and places in the diaspora where we've been. Um, so what's the process like then? So sort of when you when you sort of come to a community or a village or a, a settlement in Malawi, then what's, what's the process then of sort of getting involved? Of, uh, On the ground, you mean, yeah? Yeah. So one of the things is we will we'll, we'll, we'll work with uh, the World Food Programme. Uh, we work with local small based charities as well. And we'll see what's happening in that village, yeah? We've, especially around southern Malawi now, we're really, really well known. And in fact, we get, the, the, if you think leads or inquiries are incoming now, where they used to be out, outgoing, where we would literally, lit, at one point, when we first went over there, I would get a driver and say, right, this is a hot spot as far as the World Food Programme, United Nations is concerned, let's just drive out into the village. And literally just drive into a village. That's literally what we did. Um, and we talked to the, first of all, there, there's, there's always, um, there's always a, a, a you know, command structure inside a village so you have the um, village chief you have to go and greet that person if you don't it's seen as a it's seen as a real mark of disrespect and then you have different people looking at different parts of the village so that's we figured that out pretty quickly um, so what we do is we always engage with the village chief and what village chiefs can always do for you is there's always every village will have a community piece of land which everyone in the village contributes towards um, and this is what we've made with this project. I've quickly figured out that if we make this a village project, the village chief can get us the volunteers. The village chief can be answerable to us when things aren't going well. The village chief can then get the plaudits from the village villagers that he brought this in. You see, it's not about us. We're just enabling in the background because it's easy for us to walk into a village and giving them a load of food and saying, hey, look, look at us, man. You know, we're Sikhs and we're, this is what we do in the world. I don't think that's what we're here for. They, we never went out and told anyone we were Sikhs. They asked us questions and we told them, you know, this is what we believe in. This is what we practice. A one universal creator who is omnipresent. Um, and they were like, wow. Because I think if you go in, if we went in first with the whole religion, um, this is why we're doing it. It almost gives it, Oh, so you wouldn't do it otherwise. Mm. I'd like to think whether we're Sikhs or not, we'd still be doing this. Um, in fact, we have atheists who are part of our volunteering program. Gemma, she doesn't believe in God whatsoever, and that's fine. You know, me and her, she's one of the most altruistic. Um, I don't know what to say about the person, but she used to be a teacher in Surrey, and she gave everything up just to go to Malawi. And when I asked her, why did you do that, Gemma? She goes, because I can, therefore I should. And I think if all of us took that kind of philosophy, I think it would really clear up a lot of things rather than saying, I want to do server because X, Y, and Z. That makes it non-Nishkan for me. So I think that's the, that's the way we go in. We, we always talk about them rather than us. Uh, if they want to talk about us, we're happy to engage. Um, but we always encourage them 
if, we, if, you're, if this is a church community, then you should stick to your church. If there's anything in this church that needs doing, we will help, um, or even the mosques. Um, um, so we, we're not seen as a threat. And we don't have any ulterior motive. And that's something we religiously believe in. There's zero is what we want, literally nothing. If the chief told us to leave, we'd happily leave. You know, there's no monetary benefit for us to be there. There's no uh, religion benefit from not recruiting numbers. We're just practicing what Maharaj have given us. We're practicing that taram. Maharaj say that the whole world is a taram sal. It's a school for practicing your religion. And I'm like, wow, okay, Malawi is an opportunity for us, or the world is an opportunity in Malawi for us, in fact, is to practice it, that, you know, that, that seva given to us by Maharaj. The fact that, you know, Guru Gobind Singh Ji Maharaj's Sikhs are able to go in the world, in, in Tijuana village, when we first started serving there, we, we were greeted by all the ladies singing, you know, the typical, the way the African ladies sing, and beautiful it was. And when I asked the interpreter what we were singing, we were walking into the village, they said, oh, they sing, they sing in God's come to our village. And I couldn't believe it. I brought a tear to my eye. And at that time, I said to um, Jaspal and Prithpal, who were with me at the time, I said, saying, note the time, note where we're standing. We're standing in a village amongst four mountains here. And thank Guru Gobind Singh Ji Maharaj. Because this is what they said, that my sings will be around the world. They'll be standing and people will be singing their praises. You know, Satche Maharaj Chaldea Ustad Kare Jahan. If you walk the path of truth and taram, the world will lift you up. And that's what we're able to experience. I mean, like I said at the start of this, the, the, the theory of Sikhi is flawless. The practice is something else. We're here to practice. We're here to practice. If you guys, you've probably heard of, I'm going on a bit. You guys probably heard of someone called Gary V. He, he's online and he does a lot of stuff. Uh, he's quite a big um, entrepreneur type person. And sometimes watch some of his videos, which is quite cool. And he comes up with this really good statistic um, is that it's the chances of being born a human being are 400 trillion to one, right? So we've won the lottery. Um, being born in Guru, uh, Guru Nanak Dev Ji Maharaj's house and then take, being able to bless with Amrit, those, are, those that do get blessed with Amrit, you're in the top, top echelons of it. I mean, it doesn't come much better than that. And then going out into the world and experiencing it, that's, that's where we're coming from. That's what we try to practice when we go. Definitely. There's a, lot, there's a lot of kind of similarities as well. When we look at Sikhi and think about like Chirasi Lak lives as well, and kind of it's, it's, it's deep within us. Um, yeah. And um, so, so we're, re we're reaching the end now of our talk. So if anyone's got a question, please make sure to, to punch it in. Uh, we have one more from Amrit uh, asking, what were the biggest setbacks you've experienced in your time with Zero Hunger Remember? And what did you learn from them? Yeah, um, there's been a few, to be honest. Um, I was in Mozambique in 2018, um, looking to set up projects just over the border from where that video was shot. Um, and it was Easter time. And I got a phone call from the UK um, telling me that my brother had just passed away. Um, he was 38 at the time. Um, it was one of the most slam dunk moments i have ever had. You know, when you're traveling at 100 and 200 miles an hour, you're catching a flight every week. You're, you know, that was one of the moments where I questioned myself and the seva of what, if I, I'm trying to go out into the world and help people, right? Um, that's my life's mission. Um, but I wasn't able to help my brother. My brother committed suicide um, and I wasn't help, I wasn't there to help my brother. Um, and that played on my mind for a long, 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 long time. Um, it was very particularly hard time for me. And without Maharaj, I wouldn't have got through that of why we're here on earth, what our purpose is, what the nature of life is. Um, yeah, that was a very testing time. And it was only two years ago, about three years ago. It'll be, in fact, it'll be 31st of March. This year will be third anniversary of that, you know. Um, last year, one of our main guys in Kenya was shot. Um, shot dead in fact um uh so that was that was in fact what day did it it was his funeral was uh three days ago last year um 
and that Karan was one of my, it was beyond a brother. It become, because because I'd lost Sukhdeep, my brother, Karan became almost, he was younger than me and, and we were became that, that just filled that void for me. Um, he in fact is the guy who, who donated 300 acres of land to the, to the cause and took us from where we were to stratospheric level, world food, world food program level organization. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he, Kenya being the way it is, he was fourth generation Kenyan. Um, someone came into the compound in Nairobi in the middle of the night. He was, he obviously awoke um, and they shot him, you know, um, and, he, and he died on the spot. So within two years, I got some really, really shocking moments. And that question, you know, as a human being, it really makes you wonder like, oh my God, what it's not all hey let's go out and practice compassion and everything's lovey-dovey and rose tilted glasses and everyone's like a hip it's not like that there's a real world out there you know um and that's been really really difficult um but i'm thankful for the sangat i'm thankful to be part of the jata and i'm thankful for Pai Sabdi for helping me stay on this path steadfast and without my family my wife and my children i just wouldn't be able to do it so they're particularly testing times. Um, but you know, life, everyone goes through it um, and no one's immune to it. No, definitely, definitely. Um, we have another question here from uh, Dalmeet asking, um, how are you and your volunteers able to balance volunteering while being able to earn a living and provide for your family at home? That's a good question. I think that's, that's very good. Um, all I'll say about is Nishkam. Okay, none of us are paid for what we do. And that's even the people within the country um, and especially the Sikh diaspora, they know that. Um, I find people find time. I don't, I don't know what it is. I think if you, it's, it's like a hobby, right? You can't understand it. You, the amount of time and love and blood, sweat and tears you're put into it. But for some reason, there's something compelling you to do that. Now for someone that might be golf, for you guys, it might be playing, I don't know, what's the latest game? you're playing these days online right you're playing it till all times in the morning it's that level of addiction i i guess um i've i've always been an entrepreneur i've never worked for anybody and i think that's probably helped me in my professional career and i think that's maybe a good the, the professional part of what we're talking about this talk um and for me it's all always been about creation what i realized is i didn't realize i was a creative person when i was younger but i've sort of as i've grown and, and done my business um and then sold my business I've realized that and, and been able to create things like Zero Hunger, I've realized I'm more creative than anything else. And I backfill anything that I don't have in terms of business skills by people who actually know what they're talking about. Um, so me personally, I, I'm, I sold my company in 2014 slash 2015 um, to a point where I was retired um, and I just wanted to do something else, something new. Um, and I guess for me, I didn't want to. I didn't want to go down the business route again. Um, certainly, what I was doing before, not because I didn't like it, it's just because I'd been there, done it, and sort of got the t-shirt, and and sort of took two years out. I took two years out of of life, uh, work life, and then I came back with, with renewed vigor and said, "Look, actually, I want to create a legacy. I want to create or help contribute towards Maharaj's legacy. What's anything bigger than that?" Um, uh, and that's how I go through it. I, 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 I'm sort of lucky, I guess. And the other people are, are just normal people who work. Amarjit Singh in country, he he's runs his own printing press. He is fully um, committed towards the cause. Um, you know, and this guy goes out into the villages himself. And, and you know, it's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know why. It, it's very personal that why people give up their time. Babaji said in that video that you watched first, without sacrifice, you can't serve. And I think sacrifice is the word. Yeah. There's a lot of sacrifices that have to be given. Being, a, 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 being in Africa last year for eight months, you know, all my family lives in the UK, my kids, my mum and dad, my wife, my brother, my younger brother. You've got to be able to sacrifice these things, you know. Um, and I think um, that's, that's, that's how a lot of people do it. They, they, they're willing to, you know, for the greater good. Oh, definitely. Definitely. So if there aren't any more questions, I think that's a fantastic note to end it on, about the kind of compassion that goes into 
say bye, Miss Brown. And um, so, yeah, I think that will wrap up our talk. And did you think I just want to uh, give you a, a massive thank you for joining us today and for sharing your experiences and, and the inspiring work that you're doing with Zero Hunger with Longer. No, I appreciate um, it. I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, so we can reach you. So you have a website and, and, and you have socials. They're all Zero Hunger with Longer, right? Of course, yeah. So Instagram, Facebook, we don't really post on, we, we do post on, on, on um, social. Um, but we're, we're the, we post if there's something worth posting about, yeah. But you can reach out, you can reach out to me, uh, you know, uh, you or people can reach via you if they want to contact me personally. I'm happy to talk to people on a personal level. I prefer those personal level um, relationships more than anything else. But if you want to reach out to us on any of the handles, it's just zero hunger with longer. Uh, check out the website, have a look at the videos. If you guys have got any suggestions, by the way, look, you guys are. I'm not just saying this. I believe in the brain power that's not just you guys because you're at Cambridge Uni but anyone you've got the brain power we, we want to take this into the next level one of the things we believe is in transparency right from conception right to what we're delivering one of the things we're talking about is installing IP-based cameras with Airtel we're trying to do a program with Airtel out there which is like the local Vodafone um, they're an Indian company in fact um, and we want to where people can log on and see see our taking place okay now we need all sorts of expertise for that technology crazy ideas you know where people I, I envisage people going onto a website logging in with their own personal login and seeing the seva and if you contribute towards the seva as part of the resoy program uh, on a monthly basis then there should be i shouldn't be standing in the way of you don't need you don't need yeah and i'm trying to limit in the seva um so I would like I would like suggestions if you guys have got anything about that about what CFR means to you and how you think you know you can apply new technology or new ideas to what we're doing right so um, yeah we're always please reach out please reach out whatever the medium is um, by DM on Instagram or whatever else but I'd be really really pleased to hear from any one of you. I think you're on mute. Um, yeah. Sorry about the audio issue there. Uh, no, fantastic, fantastic. And yeah, so um, otherwise, we'll wrap up our talk about you again. Thank you for joining us. And just a, a reminder to everyone as well that uh, the Cambridge Godwara are doing a fundraiser for some renovation works. Uh, Ahmed Badi will, will drop the link in the chat. Uh, this uh, conversation has been recorded and we'll put it on YouTube shortly as well on the Cambridge Six of YouTube page. And this and our last one will be in, in two weeks' time with Pradeep Singh Nagra. And so to everyone who's come to join us and to Dajit Singh himself as well, thank you everyone. Why did you go, Khalsa? Okay. 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 Okay.